Okay, hi. Um, this is um, a video lecture. Um, leaving, picking up where we left off in class, um, where the English had just won the French and Indian War. We're going to start looking at um, the 13-year period between the French and Indian War in 1763, when no one, not, not one person in, oh, we're going a little too fast here, um, not one person in the English colonies in North America really had thought by this point um, really had, had any real idea that they would ever separate from Great Britain. That was kind of a shocking idea. That would be like people in Massachusetts starting to say, hey, let's split away from the United States, right? No, no one really was thinking that in 1763. But in a short 13-year time span, um, you know, by 1776, enough Americans, about a third of the American population, believed that they needed to, that they didn't have a choice but to split away from England. Why does this keep going on its own? This, having, this has a mind of its own here. Um, and so we're going to start to look at w what happened between that seven or 13 year period. Um, that's really what I kind of am, am calling this kind of domino effect, um, where tensions just continue to rise and rise and rise um, between American colonists and the British government to the point where we declare independence in 1776. And it really starts um, it, after the French and Indian War, which we already kind of know about, right? The effects of the French and Indian War. Um, and the big effect, really, was that, you know, if you remember, and if you, can, if you don't remember, you can actually see here, right? In 17, before 1763, um, the French had a very large amount of land here in North America. And when they lose the French and Indian War, they are forced in the Treaty of Paris to give up this land, and it becomes part of the British Empire, right? So we see here that all of the French land become part of the British um, land in North America. And this doesn't come, you know, at, you know, at no price, because the British have fought a long and costly war, and they are now in debt, and they also have a, a vast you know, amount of land here that they're going to need to pay to govern and protect. So remember, after the French and Indian War, the British government needs money. Um, and they, they start to get that money by enforcing um, taxation and um, trade regulations on the American colonists. And remember, those laws, these taxes and these trade laws had been there for, you know, forever. They'd been there since the 1600s for over 100 years. They just were never enforced. And these were the same taxes that um, British subjects all the way back in Great Britain had been paying back in England, had been paying for forever, pretty much, right? They, the British subjects over in England were used to paying these taxes. Um, and so, you know, they, they didn't think anything of it. But the Americans living here, the English people living here, had grown so used to this economic freedom um, because they were so far away, they were all the way across the Atlantic, um, they had grown so used to this freedom that they weren't used to these taxes being enforced. But all of a sudden now, the English government needs money. And so they're going to start enforcing a lot of these taxes um, that had been around uh, for a century but had just never been enforced. And so, of course, since they were so used to having this freedom, the American colonists aren't going to be too happy about these taxes. There's a couple other reasons why these taxes um, became so um, hated and why the colonists felt like they were being treated so unfairly. And it, it stems back to this philosopher, um, this, these widely held beliefs of this philosopher um, named John Locke. And you might remember him from freshman year from world history. Um, in, he was an Enlightenment philosopher from the 1600s, all the way back, you know, again, we're talking about 100 years before the Americans declare independence. He wrote his philosophies on government. And the British government was based upon these ideas of John Locke and of other, um, other Enlightenment philosophers. And so uh, the American colonists were British, remember, so they were, you know, were very well versed in these ideas. They might not have known who John Locke was, but they knew what these ideas were. It's the same way we might not know where the, the ideas of freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom of speech come from, but they're very widely held beliefs. Most Americans 
you know, know that that's part of what American government, um, you know, is about. And so, you know, the sa along the same lines, you know, the British colonists living here in America were very familiar with the ideas of John Locke. And so both of those things, both the, the idea that they had been left alone for 100 years, plus the theories of John Locke um, are going to play a role in the increasing tension between the British and the colonists. And we're going to look at the specific events that make up each one of these, you know, each one of these little dominoes that lead to eventually the last domino um, falling, which is, you know, sort of this explosion of the American Revolution in 1776. So let's look, let's look at this little cute little video I found um, that talks about John Locke's um, theories of the contractual relationship between um, the British and the government and uh, and its people, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Hello, my name is John Locke, and I'm here to talk to you about the social contract. The social contract is an idea that I had while I was sitting in my study thinking about how governments should rule over people. You see, in my time I observed that many governments did whatever they wanted and the people had absolutely no say in how they were governed. The government could raise taxes whether the people liked it or not. It was going to challenge or stop the king and his army. Absolute monarchs ruled without being challenged or questioned. They had people killed. The end of wars. They raised taxes. They built magnificent palaces for themselves who actually fought the wars, who paid the taxes, whose hard-earned money was of that went to buying all of the luxurious goods which filled those palaces. The common man, facts, and my theory of the social contract is that rulers should only rule with the consent of the people. The absolute monarchs never asked the common man what he thought about the wars he fought. And because of that they didn't deserve to rule. Only those whom the people agree with and support should rule. If a ruler isn't doing what the people want, they should kick out that ruler. This is the essence of the social contract. I like that little um, dance he does there at the end. I wanted to play it through so you could see the little dance. Um, so, uh, a couple words that you might have, um, you know, heard there that kind of maybe stuck out a little bit. The idea of uh, the government being contractual, um, that this is a contract between the people um, and the rulers. Why is this not fast forwarding? Let's see what happens here. And another word that may have uh, that may have stuck out um, was the idea of uh, consent. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, uh, we're back hopefully here. Um, so um, just to summarize, John Locke. Um, John Locke said something that sounds awfully familiar to most Americans, um, something that we know of where Thomas Jefferson actually said it. He said, all men are born with certain natural rights. We are equal with regard to the fact that we are born with certain natural rights. John Locke said, those rights are life, liberty, and property. Um, Thomas Jefferson later uses those. He actually kind of plagiarizes John Locke, which we you know is uh, not necessarily um, you know, a good thing, but we know, you know, we know plagiarism is not a good thing, but Jefferson uses these words later to declare independence. Um, he says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and, uh, he's using John Locke's words and he's doing it on, for a reason. He's doing it because he wants to remind the British government, um, that these are British philosophies that they are not upholding by taxing the colonists, um, 
and specifically by taxing them without representation. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, John Locke said government is necessary. Um, however, uh, government has to be limited. And so the reason that governments are formed by the people, the governments are formed by the people, is so that um, the people's rights will be protected. That's the only job that the government has. Um, this is the contract that um, the people are allowing the government to rule over them, but in exchange the government has to protect their rights. And it's only through the consent, you heard in that video, the consent of the governed, the permission, that's what consent means. We give permission in a representative government uh, for the government to rule. And we do this really through elections. And the people that are speaking for us in the government are called representative. They are representing us, uh, the, the, the general common man. Um, and in, you know, in America, our representation um, the people that are speaking for us in the government um, can be found in Congress, the Senate and um, the House of Representatives. Each state gets a certain amount of representatives that are speaking on behalf of the people in their state. In England, um, that representation was found in Parliament. John Locke said as well that if a government becomes tyrannical, if it starts um, if it starts abusing its power, if it stops protecting the people's rights, that the people have a right to rebel. They are justified in splitting away from that government um, or revolting um, or rebelling. And so this is what John Locke really was, um, you know, the the essence of what John Locke was saying. And this, remember again, was what all proud um, British men believed, including the American British colonists. Now, of course, we, we already talked about here, you know, the British point of view is that they need money to pay for the war. And it's only fair because the British back in England, um, across the Atlantic, the British subjects back in England um, had been paying these same taxes. And so it was only fair that the British colonists here in America um, start paying those, you know, their fair share. Um, now, the colonist perspective, going back to that John Locke philosophy was that they did not have someone representing the colonists in Parliament where this representation was supposed to take place. And so they started saying, you can't tax us. Um, it's not fair. It's an abuse of your power to tax us without us having someone in Parliament representing us. And the British government came right back and said, no, 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 you are represented. Um, it was called virtual representation. The British government said all British subjects, no matter what, you know, if you lived in Great Britain or if you lived in, uh, in the Americas or if you lived in the North Pole, it doesn't matter where you live. Parliament represents the best, represents, you know, is there speaking on behalf of all colonists and are doing what they think is best for all British subjects. And so the colonists are included in that. Um, in that representation. And so they didn't really think that the colonists needed a representative in Parliament. Um, and so when Britain passes the Sugar Act, you know, the British subjects here in America started kind of complaining, not really very loudly, kind of grumbling under their, under their um, you know, under their breath. It's not really fair. You know, they're crying. They're not used to paying taxes. It's not fair. Why do we have to pay them now? We haven't had to pay them in a hundred years. Um, that does not look like a tear, by the way. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're complaining about this and they start to kind of grumble, we don't even have a representative in Parliament, this isn't fair. Um, and they also didn't think it was fair when the British government, oh, let me get rid of those tears there, um, when the British government, um, oops, they're not going away, um, when the British government passed the Proclamation of 1763. Now, the Proclamation Act of 1763 was really designed to protect the colonists. Remember, the, the British had gained all of this new land that had previously been French. And the colonists were starting to move on to that land um, because that's what they wanted. But remember, who's also out here are those Native Americans who are um, now even more angry because they had been promised a lot of things for, by fighting with the, some of them switched sides and started fighting with the English um, on this promise that they would get a bunch of stuff from it, and they don't—they never—they never got what they were promised, and so they want to keep this land for them. The British subjects want the land to be, you know, to be British, 
Um, the colonists want to move on to that land and take it for theirs and start making money from it. And so there's these conflicts that start to emerge between the British colonists and, um, and the Native Americans. And after one particularly successful Native American um, war, really, led by, um, led by a Native American named Pontiac, the British government decided it was for the best, it was in the best interest of the colonists, let me get rid of this, to draw a line and force the colonists to not move past this line. Right? This was called the Proclamation Line of 1763. And the colonists could not move past this line. You can see it here in red. I'm tracing it. It's like a red dashed line. Which really, as you can see, was pretty much where the colonists already had existed before uh, the French Indian War. So they're not going to think it's really very fair. They think we fought this war and now we're being asked to pay taxes, which they they don't really pay because they don't want to pay it. Um, and, you know, oh, why are my drawings staying on there? Um, and so they don't think it's fair that, um, you know, that they are being, they are being told that they can't move onto these, onto these lands. Oops, they're not going to erase either. Um, and so the British don't understand it because they think, well, this is for your own good. We're trying to protect you. Um, but the colonists are not happy with the proclamation of 1763. And the colonists are also kind of confused about the Sugar Act. Um, getting back to the Sugar Act, I forgot to mention. The Sugar Act, again, was, was part, uh, part of it was that mol was a molasses act that had been on, you know, had been passed all the way back 100 years in about 1660, 1670. Um, the Sugar Act actually lowered the tax um, that was already in place. And so the British government thought, well, we're trying to be fair here. We're lowering the tax. But the British subjects, the Americans living here, um, really didn't think, oh, what was that? Really didn't think it was fair um, because, again, remember, it didn't matter whether those taxes were on the books. I don't know why this is not. Oh, there we go. It didn't matter whether those taxes were on the books. Um, and it didn't matter that they were lowering the taxes because the higher tax was never enforced in the first place. And so um, at this point, whether it was lowered or not, it was a tax that they weren't used to paying. And so um, they didn't think it was fair. So the British are confused. And um, by, by this point, though, nothing had really happened. The colonists were sort of griping and complaining and kind of it's not really fair, kind of under their breath. Um, but something happened in 1765. Um, that really caused a crisis. This was a crisis, um, you know, and this was the Stamp Act. There was a couple reasons why this was causing such an outrage. One, it was the first direct tax, meaning um, the Sugar Act was a tax that was placed, it was an indirect tax, it was a tax that was placed on goods at the time that the goods came off the ship. So the goods come in to dock and, you know, there's a, it's, a, it's in bulk and there's a box of, you know, I don't know, 10,000, you know, um, 10,000 units of a product. And the tax is placed on that big, you know, that big shipload of 10,000 units. It's not, um, so by the time it gets to the individual merchants, right, merchant number one takes 100, merchant number two takes 100, merchant number three takes 100, and they start to sell it to the public, that tax has already been incorporated into the price. Well, the stamp tax was the first direct tax. First of all, it was on all paper goods, anything that was paper, um, newspapers, uh, playing cards, paper to write letters on. And remember, they didn't have email, they didn't have phones, so letter writing, you know, was, um, was really, you know, the only way to communicate. And so anything that had, anything that was made out of paper had this stamp on it, which was just kind of adding sort of salt to the wound because it was just a daily reminder. Every time you bought a, a paper product, it was this reminder, you're being taxed, you are being taxed. It was this, let's see if we can find, um, let's see if we can find a... Uh, a picture of this. Oh, let me get rid of this. If we can find a picture of a stamp hat. See what Google has to say about this. Here we go. This is a good example. So 
here you have this is the stamp that would be on uh, an example of the stamp that would be on um, on one of the paper products, you know, on the corner. It was a raised seal or a stamp, and it, you know, it was literally um, a stamp on um, on this on this product, and it was a daily reminder that they were being taxed, and it was also a direct tax, which means that you paid it just like we pay a sales tax. You paid the tax at the time of purchase, and so you go to buy the product. Go to buy the playing cards, and the playing cards say they're a dollar. Of course, there were no dollars back then, but um, you know the, the playing cards say they were a dollar. And you go to the cash register, and in fact, you're paying a dollar ten because there's a tax. So it was a kind of a, a reminder every time you bought this product that you were being taxed. And it was also the first tax designed to raise money or revenue for England, rather than to just regulate trade. The other colonists, or the other, I'm sorry, the other taxes were designed to get the colonists to buy English products instead of other products. Um, and this tax in particular was detested because it was specifically designed to raise money. And it was a really high tax because of that, um, because of that design, because it was designed to raise money. And so people start getting really angry over this tax. They are not happy. Um, and you know, they begin to protest very loudly. They organize um, boycotts. A boycott is when you, um, you know, you don't buy a certain product or you don't take part, you won't use a certain product. Um, they start boycotting British goods. Um, they start beating up tax collectors, ransacking their homes, stealing the tax money. Um, they start picketing, they start protesting. Um, it's starting to get really violent. And the height of this violence is actually in New England. Remember, New England, um, you know, this is where it's going to hit the hardest because New Englanders were the ones that depended on trade. And so this is going to take specific, uh, the, the Ma New Englanders and especially people in Massachusetts are going to take, um, especially take offense to these taxes. And so um, they begin, again, becoming very violent. They start doing something that, um, you know, you might have heard of if you look at this. Uh, at this picture, you'll see um, this man right here is the tax collector, and what they are doing to him is um, they are tarring and feathering him. This was um, something that you know kind of was laughed at, ha ha, you know, look at the turkey, whatever, um, you know, this this stupid tax collector. Um, but in essence, it was very painful. It was extremely painful. They are pouring hot, 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 scalding hot wax over this man's body who's really only just trying to do his job that he's being paid for. Um, and, you know, and then they're throwing feathers on him and sort of carrying him through town and, you know, demonstrating him as this example of what's going to happen if you try to collect these taxes. You can also see they're actually pouring tea down his throat. Um, that was after the Tea Act. We haven't gotten to that yet. Um, but, you know, this is becoming a very, very violent. And remember, you know, or think about, not remember, but think about if you were a tax collector, what are you going to do um, if, if this is what's going to happen to you? I mean, if you look in the background here, you see the, the threat here is of violence because they have a noose hanging off of this liberty tree, as they call it, the tree of liberty. Um, and, you know, you notice here in the background as well, um, you know, the ship, this is probably in the Boston Harbor. You see them, um, you know, getting rid of, this was probably after the Tea Act, if you know anything about the Boston Tea Party. They're getting rid of, um, you know, the British products. They're throwing them overboard, um, costing the British government a lot of money um, and costing a lot of pain to the British tax collectors. And so the British tax collectors actually stop doing their job. Um, and the idea, you know, spread beyond Massachusetts when word gets out. Um, it's not quite as outrageous outside of um, outside of Massachusetts, but people start to hear about these um, horrible British actions, these tyrannical British actions, um, and they start talking. They really start talking about, well, what can we do about this? Should we start to organize our militias? Remember, the militias are the colonial um, the colonial units, these unorganized military units. They weren't paid for being soldiers. They weren't professional soldiers. They didn't train, um, but they were sort of these men who would volunteer um, at a moment's notice to just 
you know, drop their their farm tools and pick up a gun if the colony needed, to, you know, to to sort of protect itself. That's what the, these militias were. And other colonies started to talk about, well, what if this is going to, ha- what if this starts to happen to us? What if the British government starts to become tyrannical and starts to oppress our rights? And so the British um, citizens begin getting gathering together, um, and in their in their colonial legislatures, in their colonial um, representative bodies, and start talking about what what's going to happen if the British government starts to take away our right to self-government. What if they start to tax us? What if they start to become abusive and tyrannical? And the Virginia legislature in particular, starts to talk about possibly um, getting their militia together to go up to Massachusetts to help out their fellow colonial. And this is really the first time that you see the colonies are starting to become sort of united behind this cause. Um, before this, it was, oh, Massachusetts was, was one you know separate colony and Virginia was a separate colony. And they didn't really link together for any really, they weren't unified in any particular means. And now you start to see they're starting to kind of feel unified against this common enemy, the British government. Um, and a man by the name of Patrick Henry gives a very, very famous speech. He was a really good speaker. Um, he had this sort of way of acting um, his speeches out. He didn't just, you know, if you think about what, you know, if, you, if you've ever heard a good speaker, um, they're very charismatic. They have a way of, they know when to sort of hit a high note and when to sort of trail off and they know um, you know, what what points to really hammer home and what points to, um, you know, to sort of just say very quietly. And so in this particular speech, he walks out on the floor of the Virginia legislature and they're talking and they're fighting about whether or not they should get involved in this, um, in this fight between Massachusetts and the British Parliament. And Patrick Henry walks out and he's very, very quietly holding his hands out in front of him as if he has these shackles on, these kind of handcuffs on his hands, and he's holding his hands out in front of him. And he starts talking about very quietly how the war has already begun, and we are already in chains. Um, the fact that we don't have representatives in, in Parliament, the fact that the British government are treating our fellow colonials this way. And he starts talking about, you know, um, do we really want to stay a part of this um, this British Empire who's going to treat us so poorly, even if we're making a lot of money, um, even if we are benefiting from being part of this, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased by the chains of slavery, he says. Um, you know, I know we all want to keep the peace, but we have to start thinking about what cost peace is going to come at. Um, if our rights are being abused, is peace, um, is peace you know, uh, enough? And then he starts to get you know, louder and louder and louder. And he raises his fist and he says, Forbid it. I know not what course others may take, but for me, give me liberty or give me death. And he raises his hands above his head and he breaks the shackles um, you know, from his hands. And he says, I would rather have liberty than, pe- you know, than, uh, you know, than, than be oppressed by the British government. And if it means that I have to fight and die for my liberty, then so be it. And so, you know, this is this is beginning to be sort of the mindset among some of the, the colonists that they believe that, um, you know, they're going to have to fight the British. They're not talking about fighting for their independence yet, but they're talking about possibly having to fight the British to show them that they are serious about um, that they that they will um, that they will fight for their for their rights. Um, if the if the government is going to become abusive and tyrannical, they will fight to protect their rights. And so um, eventually the British government does not want a fight. You know, they do not want to lose their colonies. Their colonies make a lot of money for them. And the tax collectors, (laughs) remember, are, you know, really fearful. They're going to, they think they're going to get killed if they keep collecting taxes. So they stop collecting the tax altogether anyway. And the boycott is costing British, you know, the British money. And so they finally just bow down to the whim of these colonials and, you know, they sort of, uh, they repeal the, the Stamp Act, kind of like whimper away with, like a dog with his tail between his legs. Um, and here you have a, a political cartoon um, where they're symbolizing the death of 
you know, this is a funeral march as they used to have in the colonial days, the death of the stamp tax. They, it's kind of mocking this idea that the stamp act has re been repealed. And the colonists now have gotten their way. And so they're not going to be happy, really, at this point. They're not going to be happy with any tax. And they've now proven, they've now proven um, that they can use violence to make the British do what they want, meaning to make the British not tax them. And um, this is gonna, this is gonna prove um, to probably have been a pretty big mistake uh, in hindsight on the part of the British government that the British government didn't stand their ground um, and sort of, you know, quash this rebellion uh, or these rebellious acts before. Um, you know, and they sort of listened to this, uh, to these rebellious, um, they bowed to the whim of these rebellious colonists. And it, it's going to prove to probably be um, something that they're going to regret in the future. Um, but they do pass this law, it's almost comical, it's kind of funny, that they pass this law that almost is kind of just, the law doesn't really say anything, it's called the Declaratory Act or the Declaratory Act. Um, it doesn't really say much, it just says, don't forget that we're still your boss. Um, it declares that they have the right to pass laws over the colonists. Um, in my opinion, in my mind, I kind of picture these colonists that are um, over there that have just gotten the, the most powerful government in the world to repeal this tax, right? Like a dog um, kind of whimpering away, whimpering away with their tail between their legs. And here they, they pass this law that says, oh, but don't forget, <laughs> we're still the boss. I think it's kind of funny. I picture the, the colonists over in America kind of saying, oh, yeah, right, okay, okay, Great Britain, whatever you say, yeah, okay, we know you're still the boss, but, it, you know, they really know that they've gotten their way. Um, and then the British, the British kind of say, ooh, wait a minute, let's go back to the way it was before the Stamp Act. Let's go back to those indirect taxes. And they, they start to try to, to place these indirect taxes on um, things like glass and lead and paper and tea, basically everything. Um, and it doesn't work because now the colonists are so aware after the Stamp Act crisis, they are so sort of alert to any tax that it doesn't matter because they don't want any tax at all, right? At this point, any tax is not welcome. Again, because taxation without representation is tyranny you know, they're going to start yelling that and, and you know, it, it, it's not fair, this is abusive, we don't have a representative in Parliament. Um, and the British government, the, well, they're like, oh, crud, what did we do? We want, you know, we, uh, you know, we really made a mistake here. We should have just stayed with the indirect taxes. We might, we might not have, um, we might not have had the problem we had, uh, we have on our hands now, but, but they do. And the British government responds by sending more troops over. And this only further heightens the tension um, in the colonies because uh, the British troops are visual reminders. These red coats are these visual reminders every day um, that the British government is here and that they are going to enforce these taxes, um, even if it means arresting people, uh, even if it means that it's going to get to, uh, you know, that the, that the soldiers need to use violent measures. Um, against the colonists or even put them in jail um, for speaking out and so it's gonna get more intense and now we're up to about 1768 the British sends over um, you know a vast amount of um, British troops a couple probably ten, uh, probably about 10,000 troops I could be wrong about that um, probably about 10,000 troops um, to come and you know, make sure that these taxes were being paid and that the tax collectors were safe um, and the colonists are just not happy that these, that these troops are here. Um, it's not wartime. The troops are not necessary. Um, and they want to go back to the way things were before the French and Indian War where they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. And there really weren't any troops here. There weren't any enforcement um, of these laws. And so they, they, you know, these clashes start to emerge between the British redcoats, as they were called, or lobsterbacks, as they were kind of ridiculed as they were called lobsterbacks. Um, that was a, that was a, uh, that was a, 
what's the word, that was a taunt, a jeer, um, that was an insult that the colonists used to call, like, hey, lobster back, you know, that was, a, that was an insult. Um, and just to be clear, too, these, um, these British soldiers were often very, very young, 16, 17, 18 years old, um, and some of them, or a lot of them, actually, were forced into the army as a punishment. A lot of them were either um, sort of the low, low end of society, they had committed crimes, or um, they had, you know, hadn't paid their bills, they were in debt, and so they were, um, they were kind of um, the riffraff, if you will, of society. They were the drunkards and the, um, you know, the, the sort of violent sort of riffraff back in England, and they were forced into the military. And so these are the types of characters that are coming over here um, to enforce these laws. And then you have the riffraff, you know, American colonists over here who are starting to get violent over these taxes. And a fight is, you know, um, you know, these clashes are bound to, to happen, and they do. Um, and so just to summarize here, the colonists, um, to make matters worse, are often forced to quarter or house these officers. Um, and there's just this growing resentment over what the colonists feel is a loss of freedom. They feel like their rights have been taken away. Um, and, you know, and then there's just the added insult of, you know, the fact that these, these lobster backs are here and they're all over the place and they're, you know, in, in Boston in particular, they've been sent because Boston is the height of the of the um, violent reaction against these taxes. And so now you walk down the street and it used to be this pretty common uh, you know, area, and now it's been taken over by these, you know, horrible red coats, and um, you know, it's just, it's just not um, something that the English citizens here in America are happy about. Um, and we're going to pick up there on the next, um, the next video, and um, I will see you in class. Have a nice night.